what we're looking at this evening is key investment ratios. So the obvious ones, price earnings, and, and, and the really basic. And I'm, I'm going to leave price earnings and peg ratio and, and jump a little bit on from that. There are, you know, when I when I thought of this presentation and when we devised it as, a, as, a, as an idea, we came up with about you know, eight or ten of them, and then I started doing digging, and, and there are literally hundreds. There's almost probably, probably in fact, thousands of, of investment ratios. So a couple of things. Firstly, I went for those that are mostly official investment ratios. Those are part of the IFRS accounting principles, so that they're quantifiable. Some of them are not, and, and I've only included one that's not an official term, uh, that's EBITDA, and I'll touch on it when I get to it and why I've included it. Um, but I've gone with the official ones because that means we really can measure apples with apples. If we haven't got official accounting terms, they're broadly meaningless um, and therefore of no use to us. And further, what I then did was, obviously, this is, you know, what do we want to say? Bias. This is what I've determined to be, to be the ones that I particularly like, the ones that I use, the ones that I go and check. In many cases, we've got to calculate the numbers ourselves. The companies don't always readily throw the number out. We've got to go and calculate it. Your online broker might have it on their website depending who your broker is and what they're providing and the like. But the point, I suppose, what I'm saying there is that this is not necessarily a definitive list. If you, if you like X ratio and for you it's massively important, well, then use it. Now, I'm not saying don't. I'm saying these are the ones that I particularly like. And there's, as I said, time at the end, we can certainly take some questions and debate different ratios and the like. It's important with investing. It's important with most things, but obviously a lot in investing. We can't look at numbers in isolation. If I tell you a company makes a million rand profit, that's meaningless. You need more information than just that million rand profit. So it, it's, it's therefore those ratios. It's taking two numbers, linking them together to get us ultimately an outcome number that we can then use and that we can then run across different companies, etc. Important to obviously understand what they're measuring and what they're indicating. What's good, what's bad, what are we particularly looking for? And then it goes beyond just using that number in isolation. If I tell you a company's got a dividend cover of three, okay, that's nice, but we've then got to go and take it further. And taking it further is comparing it to historic for the company, comparing it to future expectations, and then also comparing it against peers in the same industry. And what I mean by that is don't compare a bank with a gold mine. They're fundamentally different. But if you're looking at banks, price to books a good metric or price to net asset value, go and compare the big four banks and see what their price to books are relative to each other. Because in banking, you might find price to book and a decent average is two. In the gold mine industry, you might find it to be five. So if you were looking at a gold miner versus a bank, the bank would seem crazy cheap relative to the gold miner, but you haven't got apples and apples. So it's important to keep them in, 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 their, in their industries. That is a, a, what I call a fundamental chart. Um, I, I, I love these just because uh, they're loads of fun to make. It makes Excel look pretty and the like. What I've got here happens to be a fairly simple one. It's Sassel. It's a PE ratio. It's a seven-year PE ratio. Why seven years? Because chatting to the folks infinitely smarter than me, people like Adrian Seville, Hello Giosi, and the like, um, they've gone and crunched the data. And if you ever hear Adrian and others, they talk about through the cycle. And I was saying to them, well, what's the cycle? What, what is this duration? Uh, and the answer came back from, from most people I spoke to, seven years. And it wasn't so much that they had just gone and taken a random number. They had actually gone and crunched the data. And what I mean by crunched the data, they'd gone and looked at five years and 10 and 15. And what they discovered that seven was the ideal number. And that if you went to 10 years, your data didn't improve at all. And if you went to 15, the level of improvement was absolutely minute. And we can't, in the South African perspective, go beyond 15 because we don't really have reliable data much before sort of the early 80s. So seven years is it. So you can see what I've got here, and I take the year-end number. The blue line is simply price earnings of Sasso every year-end, last seven years. The green line is then the average over that seven-year period, and the red line is the standard deviation above and below. Simple metric for me, I like to then buy the shares on a quasi-value metric. And, and I say quasi-value because a real value investor, Benjamin Graham, would be turning in his grave if I was using value as a, 
as, as, as a methodology. But for me, I like to buy when the price earnings is around the red line. Now, SASO subsequent to this has moved. And in fact, the price earnings is now around 10 and a half. So it's now sitting around the green line. But that's when I'm looking, when I'm saying compare it with itself, let's go and get that historic data. I don't use, and what I've done here is I've used the data at every year end. I could have also done interim and final. So I could have had two data points per year. Um, that doesn't massively change the picture. What you can also do is because this is a price earnings, I could actually do it for every single day for the last seven years. What that does is just make me a very, very messy chart. And again, it doesn't actually change the numbers markedly. Now, instead of 10.2, maybe it's 10.24. To me, it's a rounding error. I'm happy with that. So I like grabbing snapshot, either annual or uh, uh, annual and interim at the same time. You can either get this from the results, the annual report, um, or in many cases, the online brokers provide it. They get the data from Profile Media. Um, it's not user-friendly. And you've got to copy it into Excel, and, and but you were asking if I have uh, macros and the like. I don't have macros and the like. There's wine to drink, there's surfing to do. Writing macros sounds like hard work. It probably isn't, but I've never investigated enough. So when I'm saying compare to itself, that's what I'm talking about. If you now wanted to compare well, Sassel, there are no other oil and gas companies in South Africa, really. But if you wanted to compare, say, FNB against Nedbank, you would just take the two companies and put them on the same chart to get a historic number for them to give comparison. Going forward, when I say compare it into the future, is always difficult because, well, we don't know what the future is going to have. The key point with the future is to broadly say, and particularly with some of them, for example, dividend cover. If you expect dividend cover to remain at, for example, three, then this is what you think will likely happen to dividend on the assumption of an increase in earnings. And that simple statement already has two assumptions I've made in it. And as soon as we start adding assumptions, we start adding risk to our assessments. So I'm starting first with headline earnings. Although we probably all know what headline earnings is, there's a very important nuance that's critically important in this space. Headline earnings, profit per share. Bottom line, company makes profit, divided by number of shares, we get profit per share. But it's headline earnings rather than just earnings per share. And the headline means they've removed extraordinary items. Those extraordinary items could be, for example, they sold a business. That technically is income, but you exclude it from headline earnings. Or maybe they bought a competitor. Technically, that's an expense, but you exclude it from headline earnings. Headline earnings is the going concern of the business, so to speak. So that's nice. We look at headlines. What's important is which headline earnings. And you will see the typical ones are just headline earnings per share. You'll then see diluted headline earnings per share. You'll then see normalized headline earnings per share. A couple of points. Normalized, ignore it. It is not an accounting term. Now, there are top 40 companies out there who will tell you what their normalized headline earnings is. The normalized part is irrelevant. The headline earnings has an accounting term. There is an IFRS. You can go to IFRS. You can check what it means. There are regulations. If you say headline earnings, this is what you have to mean. But as soon as they throw normalized in front, they're actually doing that. What it means is they treat the number. And they've tweaked it any way they want. Now, what they will often do, and if you look at some of the big banks, they will report normalized headline earnings. What have they done? They've removed the cost of their BE transaction. Now, whether they should or shouldn't move the cost of their BE transaction is a different debate. The point is, you've got to go read the small print in the annual report to understand what normalized is. Some companies tell you normalized headline earnings. And you say, what is that? What's normalized? And they actually don't tell you anywhere. To me, it's quite simple. I just move on. Why do I care about diluted? I focus on diluted. Diluted says headline earnings is profit divided by number of shares. But that's the number of shares that are an issue today. What about shares that they might issue in a month or in a year? In other words, options they're going to give to directors as the most obvious one. Diluted headline earnings takes those shares that we know will be issued in the future and brings them into the present. So it gives us a much fairer view. Typically, the difference between headline and diluted is fractions of a cent. If it's not fractions of a cent, it means they are giving 
humongous share options to directors. But that, to me, diluted is the headline number I want to see. And if I'm quoting a headline number, it's, assuming there is one, I'm quoting the diluted headline earnings per share. So headline earnings, simple, ignore normalized, focus on the diluted. Dividend yield, we understand dividend yield, you get cash from a share. That's your dividend. Companies may or may not pay. They will sometimes pay interim. Sometimes they will pay interim and final, up to the board of directors. Sometimes they will pay dividends and then they will stop paying dividends. I hate that. If you, it's like teasing me. It's like inviting me over, giving me a glass of wine and then saying, no more wine. What? Just one glass? Doesn't crack it. So we understand that. And it's a, an annual yield. So if you're looking at a dividend yield, it's the dividend that has been received over the previous 12 months. A couple of important points. Firstly, the yield that is given is not taking into account the 15% dividend withholding tax. So say we've got a 100 rand share and the dividend yield is 5%. That means you got a 5 rand dividend. But you didn't. You got 5 rand less the 15% dividend withholding tax. That's correct for the company to do it. Because if you're a foreign national, you don't pay the dividend withholding tax. If you're a collective investment scheme, you don't pay dividend withholding tax. We, of course, do. But if you look at a dividend yield, the money that you will receive will obviously be less 15% dividend withholding tax. And that's the important point there. So I keep hitting my doofer and it's not done. The point that I always go look at is something called dividend cover. In other words, how much of profit is the company paying out? Now, most of these um, uh, uh, companies, most of these ratios rather, can be done two ways. They can be done as a ratio, they can be done as, as a percentage. Um, and, and, and there's no standard between it. I'm going to stick with what the, the common usage is. In the case of a dividend cover, it's literally how many times does the earnings per share cover the dividend. So the example we got there is a dividend of 25 cents. The earnings per share was 100 cents, therefore the cover was four. In other words, they paid, put it the other way, they paid a quarter of the profit as dividend. What you want to look for in this place is most companies will have a policy at board level which will say our dividend cover is between 2 and 2.4, for example. That's the pick and pay dividend cover. And then they come and they, they don't quite give you a 2.4. They, they, they go outside the boundaries, in which case, why are they going outside the boundaries? What's the logic behind it? Well, what we can also see, and this is hindsight, and hindsight's a beautiful science, but African Bank, ABLE, if you go back and you look at ABLE's dividend and dividend cover, two things suddenly become apparent. Firstly, ABLE's dividend actually stayed flat for three years while profits were increasing. But they were holding cash back. Their dividend cover was getting bigger. In other words, they were paying less and less as a percentage of profits to shareholders. Was that a warning to us? Well, in hindsight, yes. To be perfectly honest, at the time, I don't know how we would have interpreted it. But what I go look for is a stable policy with dividend cover. A company that says our dividend cover is 2.5. And you know what? Every single year, dividend comes out covered two and a half times. And then they make an announcement and they say to you, we're changing our dividend cover from 2.5 to 2. In other words, they'll pay more of the profits. They've made a change. They've announced the change. That change is now the law going forward. We can see with pick and pay, they've struggled to keep within their dividend cover. They were making the profit, but they were, uh, they weren't, you know, there were some issues in terms of, of what they were paying. Sometimes they were paying more than usual. Other times they were paying less than usual. So it's a very, very small number, but it comes back to we're building a case, what I call a preponderance of evidence. And what we're looking for is, you know, go back to African Bank. Would this one-off made us run for the hills? No. But if you start getting enough red flags, maybe that's enough reason to run for the hills. So it's building that case, either a positive or a less positive one, as the example may be. Net asset value. I want to spend a bit of time on this and then it's, it's brother, which is tangible net asset value. Because in some senses it's critically important, in some senses it's less so. Net asset value is the breakup value of a company. Assets, less liabilities. In other words, 
The balance sheet is made up of assets, the things you own, liabilities, the things that you owe, monies or whatever that you owe. If that company were to be shut down today, what would you do? You would turn all the assets into cash and you would pay off all the debts that you owed and there would be money left over. That is your net asset value of the company. We then, of course, do that per share. So we take the net asset value amount and we make it per share. So we get a net asset value per share. So a company's got a net asset value of 7 Rand 50. Of course, the company doesn't trade at 7 Rand 50. It trades at an amount more than that. Because you're not buying a business because you want the breakup value of the business. You're buying a business because of the future profits that it can generate for you. And that's what ultimately, as an investment, you're buying that future profit. You're actually buying the future cash flow that comes back to shareholders. That's why discount cash flow is, or discount cash flow methodology is the most widely used value metric in, in, in the stock market. It's that future, future cash flow that ultimately we're buying. So shares will trade above their net asset value. The question is, how much above? So banks typically, our big four banks, typically trade about two times net asset value. A couple of things have happened in the last year. We've got SASFIN trading at 1.1 times net asset value, which for a bank is very cheap. For SASFIN, being a second-tier bank, <clears throat> they probably wouldn't ever trade at two, but probably 1.5 or 1.6 would be a more fair metric. Capitec as well, we've seen their price to net asset value come down. What's happened with Capitec is the price has been stuck around 200 rand for about two years. Yet the net asset value has been increasing. So the relation, the ratio has been therefore decreasing in that space. Problem with net asset value is it's literally assets less liabilities. What are some of those assets? Can we turn them into cash? You know, assets are cash. Well, of course, they're cash. But some of the assets we can't turn into cash very, very easily. And that's why we get to what we call tangible net asset value. Tangible means those things we can turn into cash. So what's the immediate one that we strip out of tangible? Is on the asset side, we remove something called goodwill. Goodwill is a couple of things. In part, an easy way of looking at goodwill, in essence, it's like a brand value. Does a brand have a value? Sure. Is it easy to pin that value down? No. Is it easy to realize that value? Probably not. You know, let's take Coca-Cola. If Coca-Cola wanted to sell their brand, I'm sure someone, Richard Branson, would buy it. And you'd probably give them a good price for it. But many brands are, you know, if we move away from the Coca-Cola and the Apple and Microsoft and into sort of the second tier brands, realizing a value on that brand is a whole lot harder. But what is the true essence of what goodwill is? So a company, company A goes and buys an, a, a competitor. And they pay, say, a million rand for that competitor. That's the price they pay for the business they have purchased. And of course, that business has... A value. The value is assets less liabilities. The value of that business is say 600,000. So they've bought an asset worth 600,000, but they've paid a million rand for it. What is that 400,000 that they've paid? Goodwill. What it is, in essence, they've bought the future earnings of the business, but we call it goodwill. It goes onto the balance sheet as an asset as goodwill. If the company that made the purchase goes bankrupt, can they realize the value for that goodwill? Short answer, no. Maybe they can get a bit of it. What you'll also find is that companies overpay for assets. And if you go back to Data in the sort of late 90s, 2000, they were buying companies. They would buy a million rand company and the goodwill would be 950,000. Now, in part, because in IT, what is your asset? Somebody's brain. And that's hard to, I mean, to say I own your brain is a little bit difficult. The corporates like to think they do. In truth, they don't really. But they were also paying massive valuations. So, so Didarch has got this amazing, and then one day they had to write the value of that goodwill down. And that was the first year when suddenly their earnings just plummeted off a cliff. April 2000. Earnings just collapsed. And they, the excuse was, oh no, but it's a goodwill write down. Okay, but it's still in accounting terminology. It's still 
it, it might be non-cash. It's not non-cash. It's non-cash when you write it down. But when they bought the asset, they paid cash then. So to call it non-cash is, to my mind, spurious. Now, die data's excuse was, yeah, well, actually, we didn't even pay cash for the business. We just issued die data shares. Yeah, but then you diluted my holdings. That's still kind of cash in a sense. So I look at TNAV. That's the net asset value I really care about. And then we find this really wonderful thing, which is classic value investing. The company's got a tangible net asset value of 10 rand a share, and it's trading on the market at 5 rand. And you think you've found the best thing in the world. You're buying 10 bucks for 5 bucks. The question is, can you sell at 10? The answer is not. Sometimes you can. I mean, there was a company, ELB, ELB Group, their electrical company. When I first spotted them on the market, they had a market capitalization. I think the market capitalization was a billion rand. They had 900 million rand in cash. I, mean, I bought the business and I basically I was paying uh, a tenth of it. Most of what I was getting was hard cash. What's happened is there's been a significant re-rating in the share price. When I first bought the EL when they were about 11 rand a share. I think they're now, I don't know, I sold them at 35, so I stopped looking at the share price. It's probably now 40 or 50 or something. But the flip side is value trap. Because remember, you've got assets and liabilities. What is the actual value of those assets and are those liabilities of fair reflection? A good example is the Don Group. When I first discovered the Don Group about 10 years ago, they had, and I forget the exact numbers, but let's say they had a share price of one rand and they had a tangible net asset value of two rand fifty. And when you queried what that tangible net asset value was, it was the prime locations of the hotels that they owned. They've got hotels in Fenton and Rosebank and the like in Johannesburg. So you looked at this and you thought, hmm, that's a real value. So that was about 10 years ago. About a year or a year and a half ago, tangible net asset value, 60 cents, share price, 40 cents. Last set of results, tangible net asset value, 20 cents. I like 3 cents, share price, 20 cents. Basically, the business got mismanaged into the ground. They weren't paying SARS. <clears throat> now, what they were doing, is they call it a notifiable offense, where you say to SARS, hey, look, we owe you this money, but we can't pay you. In other words, you're being honest about it. You're not hiding. And SARS is like, that's cool. Interest rate is, I mean, you think micro lenders are bad? Wait until you owe SARS money. Basically, they just, and, and there were some strategic blunders. There's a supply, in their defense, there's also chronic oversupply in the hotel industry. They try to switch from hotels to apartments. That took a massive capex expense. They couldn't recoup, but basically that net asset value collapsed. So the point is always, when you're trading below a tangible net asset value, is it value or is it value trap? And that's not an easy answer. There is, interestingly, Keith McClaxon did a video for us, just one lap, on how to spot a value trap. And to his defense, he called Sanyati a value trap, and he was 100% spot on. It went into bankruptcy. It looked good, but when you started to dig, it wasn't quite so good. EBITDA, earnings before interest tax depreciation and amortization. Gibberish, complete and utter, means nothing. There is no accounting term for it. This is a word that was used up. It was actually, it comes out of the 1980s when they were doing all the mergers and acquisitions, particularly leveraged management, buyouts, etc., etc. So what do you got? Earnings before interest, particularly. Forget the tax part, but before interest. What that means is you're basically hiding the interest payments that you have, which is usually not important unless you have massive debt. If you've done a leveraged buyout, you have massive debt. So to make it look better, they made up this wonderful thing called EBITDA. They sometimes call it Core earnings. That's not true either. You will sometimes get EBITDA margin. You will get EBITDA multiple. You will get EBITDA all sorts of things. It's a fun number. But it's not an accounting. It's not an IFRS term. So what do we actually look at is, so it's earnings before interest tax, depreciation, and amortization. Depreciation is the write-down of a tangible asset. So you buy 
a grader for a million rand. And that grader's got a lifespan of, say, five years. So every year you deduct 200,000 from its value on your balance sheet. That is depreciation. Amortization is your goodwill in essence, where you're writing down intangible assets. Okay, those are accounting principles. But you know what? You paid for the grader. And you paid for the goodwill. And I get the tax and, and, and interest part, but then there's a much better real number, operating margin, that gives you a, that, that, that's an IFRS number. What always worries me about the, the non-IFRS numbers is that, and I'm not calling them crooks, but the short answer is they, they can play with, they can play fast and loose. Because there is no standard that says, if you say this, you mean that. On EBITDA, if you say this, well, you probably mean this. But unless you ask the FD, you're not quite sure. So most companies don't touch on EBITDA. You would find a lot of the, uh, as I said, the mergers and acquisitions from the 80s, which led to savings and loans, but it's a different story. A lot of the IT boom guys, um, EBITDA in the South African space became very popular in the, the, the dot-com bubble. Um, why? Because they were having massive amortizations, massive write downs happening in their goodwills that they were paying for. I ignore EBITDA. It's supposed to be an ability of a company to service debt. I'm talking about profitability. Profitability is nice, but if you ain't got cash to back it up, it ain't much use. And if you're paying massive tax and interest, your cash could be disappearing. So it's a number I completely ignore. I go to margins. After HEPs, after diluted HEPs, my second point of call is always margin. I got an operating margin, but first let's touch on gross. Gross margin is literally, you make widgets, you sell them at 10 Rand, they cost 9 Rand, your gross margin is 10%. You make a Rand per widget. But there's obviously other costs that are involved in running a business. You would have head office costs. You might have marketing costs. The gross margin is literally what was the cost of the input material? What was the cost of staffing who work on the factory floor? What is the cost of staff? Not what is the cost of head office? What is the cost of marketing? What is the cost of the CEO's Learjet? So gross is nice, but operating in census is the real running of the business. And that is operating is essentially as EBIT, earnings before interest and tax. So that's how the the, the running of the business. Now, obviously, interest is a real cost and tax is a real cost too. And you might have brilliant operating margins but still go bankrupt because you've got too much debt and it's costing you too much money. But what I'm looking for is an operating margin that is typically stable, ideally an operating margin that perhaps is moving higher. When I interview CEOs, I'll often ask them, for example, Clover's target operating margin is 6%. And they're struggling to get there. So when I chat with Jan Forster, my question is, how's your operating margin go? Why are you not, you know, they got to 5.2 and then they slipped to 4.9. Why did your operating margin come down rather than moving higher? And he's got the answers. I mean, that's fine, but I want to know those answers. And then obviously your net margin. Net is after all costs. That's after everything. Interest, tax, et cetera, et cetera. So that's your, your bottom line profitability. And in truth, what we should look at is the relationship between operating and net. And if that starts to get massively different year to year, it means there's something strange happening in the interest and tax. Could be that interest are either going up you know, or, or massively volatile. There, there's a couple of companies out there who have taken two companies, well, yeah, two of them. The one took a short-term loan from a director, a million rand loan, and they were paying 50,000 rand per month to pay back the loan. That's 5% per month. Another company took a loan, and they were paying between 8 and 10% per month interest on the loan. That is onerous. Uh, the first company has paid back. The second is still suspended, sack oil. That nasty piece of debt they're trying to convert to equity, it's because that debt costs them between 8 and 10% per month. Equity. 
Equity is a word we use loosely. We will sometimes talk about equity and we'll mean shares or, or the like. But in this case, I'm talking about equity on a balance sheet. When I talk about net asset value, it's typically net asset value per share. Here we look at equity. That is, again, that breakdown. It comes to your what we call the accounting equation. The accounting equation, equity equals assets, things you own, minus liabilities, things that you owe. Equity in itself, uh, it sits on the balance sheet. If your equity is negative, you technically are bankrupt. And what equity ultimately is, is it's shareholder funds plus retained earnings. So a company gets launched and the founding of the company, they put 50,000 rand in, there's 50,000 equity. And then as they retain the earnings, retained earnings, you made a buck in profit, but you only paid out 40 cents in dividend. That's 60 cents as your retained earnings. Equity in itself, nice, useful, but it's what we do with it that becomes important. We do two prime things with it, debt to equity. Total debt divided by the equity. We run it as a percentage. Debt for a company is not necessarily a bad thing. If a company can borrow money from the bank and pay 10% interest, and they can plow it into the business and make that money grow at 15%, they're ahead of the curve. And then one day the debt is paid off and they're well ahead of the curve. Of course, if their debt is costing 20% and they're only, pay, they're only growing it at 15%, then they're massively behind the curve. The question is how much debt and how much is realistic. Now, again, a debt number in isolation doesn't tell us much. And I've got a, another, I've got quick and asset test ratios later in the presentation, which give us what we call solvency or liquidity. And that's the ability to pay the short-term debt. Here what we're looking at is total debt. And typically you would get a number that's probably as a broad average for the, for the market as a whole between 35 and 55% debt to equity. And that's generally considered to be fairly comfortable. Some companies will tell you, and I forget which, there's a company recently, uh, debt to equity 17%, and they want to push that number a little bit higher. Aspen's debt to equity currently quite low, they're going to push it up to about 42%. And then that will unwind over the next three years and come back down to about 25% in three years' time. What are you looking for? The trend. What has their debt to equity been over the last seven years? How have they been managing it? If debt to equity starts getting sort of up into the, the 60s and north of that, I start to get a little bit cold feet. Some companies are massively cash generative. Aspen. I mean, what Adrian Saad does is he buys businesses that are already cash generative. And he takes that cash and pays off the debt. So their debt gets paid off very quickly, all things being equal. So they can perhaps push their debt to equity a little bit higher. Their companies, uh, Metrofarm, at one point I think their debt to equity was over 200%. And the, the fact that they didn't survive is credit to management. I don't know how they survived, but they did. And they've now got that number down to 40. It's taken them a decade. Interest covers an ability to pay interest, not debt, interest. If you've got a million rand bond on your house, I mean, yes, you owe the bank a million, but your commitment every month is your 10,000 rand bond. And as long as you can pay the bank 10,000 rand every month, the bank's happy. If you stop paying the 10,000, the bank is deeply unhappy, and they're going to come and kick you out of your house. So what you look for is interest cover. And that's your EBITDA, which is essentially your operating profit, earnings before interest and taxation divided by interest payments. In essence, it's your cash flows coming through. I put this in. I, I, I don't use interest cover. I go use a, a, an asset test ratio. But it, it, it's, it's there because it seems to be fairly popular when digging around and when chatting with some of the, the asset managers and the like in Johannesburg prepping for this presentation, a lot of them said, interest cover. And when I said to them, what about the asset test ratio? They're like, oh, yeah, I know. They, they remember that, but they don't use it. Um, that, that's fine. I suppose it's personal preference in a sense. So what you're looking at here is what we call solvency. Solvency, ability to pay short-term debt. As long as you can pay your debt, you're not in trouble. As soon as you can't pay your debt, you become in trouble. There is a caveat to that, and I kind of flipped over it a moment ago. It's called debt covenants. 
So when a bank lends me or you money, the debt covenant is pay this amount every month. When a bank lends a company money, there's, diff there's typically, well, pay this amount every month, but there will be other metrics that they have to keep within. So the bank might also say you need to, and I'm just pulling random examples out, your EBITDA margin needs to be 20%. And if it drops below 20%, you are in breach of the loan, and we can call that loan back. Finding the debt covenants, you've got to go to the annual report and dig. Two examples in recent years of debt covenants that tripped up companies. One was Blue Financial Services. What hurt them was their debt covenants. Because, of course, they were micro lenders. So what happened? So they go and they borrow money, long-term cheap, and they lend it short-term expensive. They breached debt covenants when the crisis hit in 2008, and the people who had lent the money suddenly could ask for it back. Their problem was the people they'd lent money to weren't paying it back. More recent, Lonman. The reason Lonman had to do a rights issue, a couple of reasons, but the key reason Lonman had to do a rights issue was they were in breach of their debt covenants. Now, if a company is in breach of their debt covenant, they have to, make not they have to notify the market of this fact within the results. So if they go in breach today and the results come out in five months, they tell you in five months' time. The point is that if they if they if they one inch away from breaching their covenant, they don't have to say a word. So what you have to do is go to the annual report, go to the section on debt, find out what the debt covenants are, and go and see how come. And typically in an annual report, they will tell you how they are stacking up against these debt covenants. But the risk is, what happened with Lonman is, the bankers basically said, okay guys, you're in breach of your debt covenant. You've got to do one of two things. Give us the money back, or go raise money somehow. They couldn't give the money back, so they did a rights issue to raise the money. They basically had to refund the company. Return on equity. Remember what equity is. Equity is sh shareholder funds. Assets minus liabilities. Pot of cash. That's what your business is. That is as a shareholder what you're buying. Yes, I know you're buying future profits and future cash flow, but at the hard core of the, of, of the coal face, you're buying that equity. This is how much profit did you make relative to that equity? Typically expressed as a percentage. And different industries, uh, yeah, the mining industry are struggling to get into double digits. And then there is Woolies. Return on equity, 49.7%. I cannot find a retailer in the world, anywhere on planet Earth, that has a return on equity that is better than that number. That is, I mean, it's just, it's a gobsmacking number. But here's the other side of the equation. So the yellow line, forget the yellow line, that's weighted average cost of capital, that's not exciting. The red line, that is their move over the, since June of, of 2001. You can see the bit of a wobble that happened in 08 09. Hey, that's fine. You know what, 08 09? Wobbling was allowed. But what have we got there? Basically a line that goes up. They had a return in equity in 2001 of 12.3. 12 years later, 49.7. That says to you, wow. I mean, it's just the most, and this is a chart I've been watching. I picked up, I bought my willies somewhere around that dip area, and I remember seeing that, debt, that, that return on equity come down. And I remember thinking, I wonder if they're going to do the, you know, nice little rise and then a collapse. And I thought, now, you know what, willies, they're good management. They'll probably keep it stable at around 30%. Turns out I underrated the Woolies management. Fortunately, I don't pay their bonuses because I would have got shoddy bonuses. So there are a couple of things we look at this. Again, it comes back to trend over 12 years. It comes back to 49.7 makes it the best RAE of a retailer, I'm specifying retailer, that I can find in the world. And when you go to Google Finance or finance.google.com and you can search, and I said, show me RAE is greater than 50%. It spat out about 100 shares from planet Earth. None of them were retailers. None of them I recognized. It was like, you know, I don't know, some random mining company in Karakistan. 
They're mining, they're mining a commodity I've never heard of in a country that I can't pronounce because it's not Karakistan. That's the makeup country. Anyway, you need to get the point. The other point is, what do you do with this? Go and compare it to the competitors. So, Truwitz used to be the king of return in equity. But Truwitz kind of got stuck at about 40%. They were going up and up, and at 40%, they kind of had a ceiling. The question is, you know, how much higher can Woolies push that number? I mean, can they break 50? Make no doubt, they want to. So let's say they can break 50. Can they break 60? Surely not. And if they break 60, this, I mean, yeah. Typically, what are you getting a return in equity? Mid to high teens is a good number as a broad average for the market. The retailers in South Africa do have high return in equities. They're massively cash generative. And the truth of the matter is that we have top-notch retailers in South Africa. There are a couple of global awards every year for best retailers, different sectors, different categories, etc. And South Africa is always very well represented, not just in nominations, but in winning awards. We have some of the best retail teams in the world. That's why it's weird when Pick and Pay brings a Brit to run our retailer, because frankly, I think our retailers are better than the British. I think it should be the other way. The Brits should be poaching South Africans to go and run their stores. But Britain has a small problem, cold weather. When we talk about liquidity, or, or the, the correct term is solvency, what we're looking at is an, a company's ability to pay their short-term debt. And there are two metrics here. Quick ratio is the one that gets used most often. And what do you get? You get cash plus current assets. Remember current assets? Current means those assets can be turned into cash in the next 12 months. Now, a company could tell you, oh, yeah, we could sell everything in 12 months. But, you know, maybe they've got a, a building, and maybe they could sell it in 12 months. And they've got a factory, and maybe they could sell it in 12 months. But to me, it's it really, what is your, 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 your current really is cash. It's going to be some cash. It's going to be receivables. Receivables are you have sold the widget or the service, but you've sold it on 90 days and whoever you sold it to is paying you at 90 days. So that's pretty much money that's coming in a hurry. And then current liabilities, debt that falls due in the next 12 months would include overdraft, any short-term debt you have, and long-term debt that is expiring at the moment. And what you will see with companies, what, what they try and manage, is say they've got a large debt expiring in 18 months' time. They will try and renegotiate it before it becomes current. I would roll it out further. But what this says is if things go horribly wobbly, can they pay their short-term debt? This is money that they need to pay in the next 12 months. Can they pay? Forget about profit they might make. Can they pay it from money in the bank? It's like the bank manager coming to you and saying, I know that you've got a million rand bond, and I know you pay me 10,000 rand a month. I also know you pay me the 10,000 rand a month from your salary. That's great. But how much money do you have in savings in case you lose your job? And that's the question we're asking here. How much money does the company have in savings in case, for example, 2008 happens? Where suddenly your earnings fall off a cliff. Look what happened to the platinum mines. The platinum miners were paying special dividends of 30, 40, 60 rand in 2007. Now the share prices are almost 30, 40, 50, 60 rand. Why? Because the debt, well, a number of issues happened. But the first issue that happened was their profit, their revenue just fell off a cliff. Revenue collapsed. Why? Because platinum went from 2,200 to less than, I think it went to 1,000. And then what happened? Your costs went up. And then, of course, ESCOM shut down. So you couldn't mine any platinum. So that is saying, don't tell me what your interest cover is. Interest cover is what you, yeah, tell me cash in the bank. But I take, I prefer what we call the asset test. Asset test is simple. Current assets and remove inventories. Because inventories sit here as current assets. Problem with inventories is, look, if the world market is collapsing, can you sell them? What price can you sell them? You might be selling luxury motor cars, and that motor car is sitting on your book at 5 million rand as a current asset, 
the market collapses and you can't sell it for a million. In other words, don't tell me about inventory. And current assets includes cash, of course. So in fact, when I say cash plus current assets, that's actually meaningless. And again, receivables, yeah, but can they pay you? They haven't paid you, probably because you give them terms. You deliver the service or the good, and you say, pay me in 30 days or 90 days. But not everyone who pays or is supposed to pay in 30 or 60 or 90 days does pay. And if you're suddenly hitting a cash crunch, it might be specific to that one company. But it might also be wider than that. It might be 2008. In which case, the people who owe you money might be struggling to pay as well. So that's why I prefer the asset test ratio. And what you got here is ultimately a number relative to one. The higher above one it is, the better. As it drops below one, it's less good. Because below one simply says that your current liabilities, in other words, your debt that, shows, that falls due in the next 12 months is greater than your ability to pay it. So you want that number that's sitting north of one. In your big companies, the top 40s and the like, this is a number that usually when you look at it just bores you every time. Because they can manage it. Because they have massive current assets. They're sitting on huge amounts of cash. Their current liabilities are minute because they're constantly, they're managing the debt. They've got long-term debt. And when the long-term debt, debt gets to like a three-year period, they roll it back into another five or seven-year period. The flip side is if you see a top 40 com company and their asset debt rate, asset test ratio is suddenly hitting one. To recap, those are the ones I wanted to run through. As I said right up front, there are others. And this is not a definitive list. This list is a... Uh, Restricted by two points, one being time, that I only have 60 minutes and I've got four and a half of them left. And the second part being is, yeah, yeah if you want to do every single one, then it becomes a five-year accounting decree. But those are the ones that I'm looking for. And what am I doing when I'm building an investment case? It's what I like to call preponderance of evidence. You never look at one number and say, yes, that's why I like it. What I do is I build a case as to why I like a business. Hello Giosi summed it up best. You want irreplaceable, impenetrable businesses. And you've got to have the metric which defines irreplaceable and impenetrable. He, he uses Porter's five forces. So Porter's five forces include things such as, Porter's five forces is a book on, on strategy for business execs, but it's useful for valuing companies as well. Not for valuing, but identifying. And Hello will tell you that of the 400 companies on the JSC, 70, 70 are, in, are irreplaceable, impenetrable. Let's look at the big telcos, MTN and Vodacom. Are they impenetrable? No. What did government do to them on Friday? To get a shot across the bow, it was a shot deep into the heart. One of the issues of Porter's five forces Regulation, government. Sometimes regulation works in your favor. Sometimes regulation can be a threat to you. If you're a bank, regulation works in your favor because setting up a new bank is not easy. If you're a telecom company, regulation, well, you've got actually two parts. One is that you can only be a telco company if the government gives you a license. The other part is the government has to approve your fees and tells you what your interconnect rate can be. Other forces are, what is your influence with your supplier and your client? If you've got a supplier and you need to have a particular product and there's only one person in the world who provides that product, you are in trouble. Because tomorrow they say to you, you know what, the price just doubled. And what can you do? You pay double. Because there's nowhere else to go. What about the ability to, to replace? One of the problems the platinum miners have is that platinum is used in catalytic converters. But if the platinum price went to $5,000 an ounce, what would happen? They would switch to palladium. Now, switching to palladium is not easy. But at $5,000, the industry would do it. At $1,500, at $2,000, there's a point 
at which the platinum price goes too high, the demand falls off. So I'm looking for those irreplaceable impenetrables. I think Willie's is one of them. Um, I think uh, 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 Chop another. I think British American Tobacco, although there's some issues there. I mean, what, what we're seeing is smoking getting... I mean, New Zealand is going to ban smoking on the entire island. It will become the first smoke-free country in the world. I haven't told the potheads yet in New Zealand, of course. <laughs> Um, but it, it, it's finding those errors. So what you do is you identify the company, that, and then you go through your preponderance of evidence, and then you wait for the price to be right. I've been, I've been doing a lot of interviews for a book I'm doing, and the most frequently used metric for price is right, discount cash flow. Why? Because cash is king. Why do we buy a business? Why do we buy a company? For the profit we're going to get from it. Where's that profit going to come from? Cash flow. How's it going to come to us? As dividend. The share price that goes up tenfold is nice, but the real business of business is cash. For you, you've got to decide for yourself which are important. You've got to decide for yourself which, you know, which are important across different industries. You know, what I haven't got here, for example, is cost of income, which is niche to banking industry. Or in payments, which again is niche to, well, retailing and banks. In, in, the, in the mining space, head grade is important. How many grams of gold or platinum per ton of rock do you get? So they've all got their niches as well. This was very much looking at the top. Decide what's important to you, understand that interest specific, and then compare historic, try and work out future. I'm very skeptical of future because that's so many if, buts, and maybes. Compare it against their peers, compare it against the industry, and don't be scared to benchmark them globally. Now the fact that Sasso doesn't have a competitor in South Africa is irrelevant. We go find a global competitor. Notwithstanding, firstly, Sasso competes in a global market, and secondly, it's becoming easier and easier for us as South Africans to invest in a global market. So if you discover that Exxon Oil is a far superior company to Sasso, well, go buy Exxon Oil rather than Sasso. 